Hey, glad you could be with me here today. Uh, for this particular lecture, we're going to focus on the concept of leadership. Now, just to give you a brief overview of what we're going to be covering here today, we're going to be going over some of the differences between management and leadership. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes the terms are used interchangeably when, in fact, they're quite different. We're going to discuss this concept of leaders being born versus made. Uh, we'll also discuss a couple of approaches to leadership, the behavioral approach, uh, the trade approach, the situational approach, the transactional approach to leadership, transformational leadership. And then lastly, we'll end by discussing the decision-making model and some of the behavioral issues involved with making decisions. Now let's go ahead and begin by discussing the differences between management and leadership and really those lie in a couple of different areas. Uh, first with regards to goals. Um, the goal of management is to achieve organizational objectives. There are goals and objectives that were established by the particular company that that manager is pursuing. With leadership, the, the intent or the goal, that end result could be a number of different things. Managers usually lie in organizations and they have specific titles that grant them certain responsibilities and certain authority. Leaders reside in a number of different areas. You can have leaders that virtually any level of an organization, obviously not in a particular organization. Anytime you have one or two people getting together, there is the, the possibility of leadership being influenced in that particular setting or leadership being exercised or engaged in. So it isn't necessarily an organizational context where management, you need to have that positional power. There has to have that setting for it to take place. Now, one thing I'll mention is that managers certainly can be leaders, but a lot of times based upon past experience, I'm sure you're aware, there are a lot of managers who are not leaders. And leaders certainly don't need to reside in management, but a lot of times we do have managers who are in fact leaders. Now they also differ in terms of how they influence others. Uh, with managers, I mentioned that they have positional power. It's the ability to hire, fire, promote, provide salary increases or decreases, favorable working conditions or unfavorable working conditions. And because of these uh, abilities, managers have power because you don't want them to utilize this power in a negative way, or at least you wouldn't hope that they would. So that lends itself for followers being compliant with a manager because they do have that positional power. Now, leaders don't have positional power. They have to use their own influence. You have to want to actually follow that particular leader to agree with whatever decision that they are making to understand the process and to understand their intent and agree with their vision. So it's much, much different. Leaders can't rely on positional power because oftentimes they don't have any. When you follow someone who is a leader and they're exerting that type of influence, you do so because you feel like it's in your best interest, because there's a commonality, a shared vision, so to speak, not out of obligation necessary, necessarily. And lastly, with regards to setting, I mentioned before that Managers typically reside in an organizational setting. They have a specific title, specific authority, what they can and cannot do, whereas leaders reside in a number of different areas, not just specifically in an organizational setting, but at all levels, right? You have leaders in your informal groups with friends. A person kind of emerges as the leader. Either they have more experience in a certain area, maybe they're more vocal, could be a number of different reasons, but they emerge as that leader in that particular setting. Uh, but obviously, there isn't necessarily a requirement. You don't necessarily uh, grant somebody the authority of leadership of the group or the title as leadership of the group, they more of emerge over the course of the group's existence. Now, are leaders born or made? Well, early on, back in the early or late 19th century, early 20th century, uh, the mentality or the thought process at that point in time was that leaders were made. There wasn't a great deal of research that was done on leadership at this point in time. It was really in its infancy that people began to 
ask the age old question, really, what are the characteristics of a leader? How do we determine if someone is a leader versus a non-leader? And early on, they developed what's called the great man theory. And the great man theory was that leaders were born and were not made, meaning that when you were born, you were automatically, for some reason, predisposed to becoming a leader. You had leaders versus non-leaders. There was not anything that you can do. There was nothing in your power that could actually change that. There wasn't a training class you can take. You couldn't develop and increase those leadership skills. You either had it or you don't, which is extremely frustrating and somewhat demotivating for some of us who maybe we aren't necessarily leaders, so to speak, right? We can't improve it. We can't gain that particular skill set. It's more innate, more of an ability. Um, so that was the thought process during this particular time there. And within that, this really produced uh, and kind of guided a lot of the research at that particular point in time because the mentality was that leaders were born and that they were not made. This shifted the course of research and research began to try to look at, well, if we know that leaders are born and not made, how do we determine if someone is a leader versus a non-leader? So the approach that was developed at this point in time um, as a result of the great man theory and trying to support that and obviously want to figure out what do what are leaders like versus non-leaders, the trade approach to leadership was developed. And this really was developed and widely believed prior to probably the mid-1900s, mid, around 1945 or so. And this was the belief that there was a certain characteristic that was essential for effective leadership. If I wanted to hire a leader, I needed to know what were they like, what were their characteristics, what were their traits, what distinguished them from non-leaders. And so a lot of the research, the trade approach was trying to identify what were these actual traits. And there was a lot of research done in analyzing some of the past leaders and trying to figure out what were they like? What did they do? Not necessarily what they did, but what were their characteristics? Things like personality, intelligence, uh, even things such as physical characteristics like height were analyzed. And that was as a result of Abraham Lincoln and obviously being tall. And they wanted to see, was there a correlation between height and becoming a leader? Um, so that was the, the mentality and the thought process that took place at this particular point in time. Now, the problem with that and the issue really is the list became so comprehensive that no one person really could meet all of the characteristics and all of the traits. There was such a comprehensive list that you really singled everyone out just over the course of you know, going down the list and making sure that they had some type of personality, some type of intelligence, all these different things that it really precluded anyone for that matter from actually being a leader. Um, which was obviously not the, not, not the case. Um, so to think that we have to possess a certain series of traits to be deemed and become a leader is a little ridiculous, right? You have people that have certain skills and certain skills in certain areas. You know, Steve Jobs, for example, very, very charismatic, so to speak. But you have leaders, Bill Gates and some others that aren't necessarily so charismatic. So charisma, which is once again, one of the things that they looked at, wasn't necessarily important or a had to be present, so to speak. Another issue was that people have a choice, right? If you're intelligent, which chances are you probably are intelligent, you have a choice whether you use that intelligence. And so to think that because you are intelligent, you are automatically a leader is a little ridiculous as well, is somewhat naive because people ultimately have a choice. I see just in the normal course of my day, plenty intelligent students that choose not to do certain things. And in which case they don't be, they're not successful because they don't do the work. So the motivation, the behavior aspect needs to enter in as well. It's an important piece to the puzzle because I still may not utilize those natural gifts that I have. Things like my intelligence, so to speak, may not lend me to leadership. Now, with that said, certain characteristics are a good predictor of what's called leadership emergence, which means that if you have a certain set of characteristics, you may be more predisposed 
to becoming an actual leader and you may be more likely to be viewed as a leader by other people. So if you have a certain outgoing personality, if you're charismatic, maybe at least the popular consensus is that you're probably a leader, but you're still no more likely to engage in leadership than either you or myself. It doesn't matter. It's, it's a perception issue there. You know, we attach beliefs to the way that we perceive things and we think that if somebody has a certain set of characteristics or a certain personality, that must be a leader. But that always isn't the case. And it's really during this time frame, people begin to realize the importance of behavior because behavior, what you do is ultimately what is more important than your physical or some other types of characteristics which you may or may not use. Now, as a result of increasing criticism over the trade approach to leadership and obviously the thought process being, well, if leaders are certainly born, then if they have a certain set of characteristics, then why can't we, why can't we actually predict leadership? There was a shift towards what leaders actually do, right? It's important to have certain skills, certain abilities, but even more so important is actually what you do with those particular things. And this actually developed what was known as the behavioral approach to leadership. And that really was the idea that we wanted to focus on the actual behavior, the pattern of actions that took place that distinguished people that we felt were leaders versus non-leaders. What was the behavior like? What did they actually do? And as a result of the research, they identified two basic forms of leader behavior, which we now know as task-focused task leader behavior and employee-focused leader behavior. Now, task-focused task leader behavior occurs when a leader focuses on how the tasks are to be performed. Uh, the intent here is to meet, obviously, certain goals and achieve certain performance standards. So when the leader focuses on the task, they want to focus on ultimately what needs to be done and how it needs to be done in order for that particular unit to be successful. The second type of be leader behavior is an employee-focused leader behavior. And this type of behavior occurs when a leader focuses on the satisfaction, the motivation, and the well-being of employees. They're more interested in the relationship aspect than they are the productivity. And at this point in time, lead or researchers attempted to analyze the success of leaders based upon how they exhibited these behaviors. Now, what they really found was that in cert certain situations, it really depends, right? You wouldn't necessarily want to always engage in task-focused leader behavior because at certain points, your employees aren't going to be necessarily very happy with you if you're constantly dictating to them what you need done and how you need it to be done, right? And as employees develop and become more comfortable, become more competent, Really, why should you dictate everything that they do, right? That's not necessarily leadership. That's almost like uh, increasing management oversight, right? You might as well do the job yourself if you're going to dictate every little thing that's done. But on the same token, you shouldn't necessarily engage in all employee-focused leader behavior as well, right? You can't necessarily focus on making employees happy all the time because you're going to do that to the detriment of performance and productivity, and although there are things that a manager has to do to keep the peace, so to speak, they also have to have a certain level of performance or their job is going to be in jeopardy. And so this led researchers to believe that really it needs to depend upon the situation. There really isn't a good leadership style to emphasize in all situations. Managers need to be able to analyze the situation based upon what's going on and then make a good decision on what leadership style to actually use versus just one cookie cutter style to apply in all situations. Now, situational leadership is a approach that really built upon the behavioral approaches and the ones that preceded it. Uh, it tried to answer the question of really what do or what should leaders do in terms of behavior in specific situations, not necessarily engage in the same style in all situations, but what are some of the different styles that they should engage in based upon what's going on in the actual situation. So this emphasized leaders adapting their styles based upon 
what the follower or the employee is needing at that point in time. And this was developed by both Paul Hersey and Ken Blanchard. Uh, and they developed the situational leadership model, which you see here. And this particular model was a kind of a contrast between supporting and directing behaviors. Uh, the idea being that there are uh, specific types of behaviors and leaders want to engage in a good combination of both of them. So supportive type behaviors was basically consisted of the extent to which a leader engaged in two-way communication, the extent to which they listen, they provide support, they provide encouragement, right? Moral support and encouragement are very important, particularly when an employee or a follower are a little bit unsure of themselves. But they also facilitate interaction and they involve followers in decision-making. Both Hersey and Blanchard believed that this was important at some stages. They also felt it was appropriate to utilize directive behaviors. And directive behaviors are emphasized by one-way communication. The uh, leader will kind of spell out what the follower's role is, tell the follower what they need to do, where, how, and closely supervise performance. And although that isn't necessarily ideal in all situations, it certainly was ideal in certain specific situations as well. So as you can see here from the situational leadership model here on your screen, um, you're looking at a, a series of four boxes kind of. And what happens is, is that leaders should progress through this model or through this grid, so to speak, uh, in a way that is somewhat uh, consistent with where the follower is at developmentally. So they wouldn't necessarily pick one or the other and defer to that one. They would follow through this particular model in a certain specific way, which is much more appropriate than one cookie cutter model. So as you can see here, the first is directing. Directing behavior specifically has to do with the leader defining what the role of the employee is. They're telling them what needs to be done, how it needs to be done, and where to perform certain tasks. It very much emphasizes directive behavior very low on the supporting scale. doesn't mean that the leader is very mean and cruel and all those different types of things. It just means that they utilize more of a directive style, so to speak. They're more task-oriented at this stage. And the reason they're doing this is in response to the developmental level of the follower. Right? Think about when you first start a new job and everything is new. You're not quite sure what needs to be done. You're not quite sure how to perform certain tasks. This would be an appropriate style for you at that stage, right? Because you come into it and you have very low competence in that particular area. Maybe there are certain things you know very well, but for the most part, there's going to be some tasks that you're going to have to learn. And so you have a relatively low competence in those areas, but you have a high commitment. Um, and one thing I should mention is that Hersey and Blanchard both felt that the two variables that need to be needed to be considered with regards to followers was their competence and commitment at certain tasks. So you'll hear me constantly referring to those over the course of this particular slide. Those are important things to keep in mind. So at the first developmental stage, followers are, have a very low competence. They're just starting the task. They're not quite sure how to do things, but they have high commitment. They want to learn. They're excited to be there. Say it's a new job or a new position, so everything is new. It's very exciting. But you, so you want to be there, um, but you don't have the competence yet. In that case, it would be very important for a leader or manager to utilize a directing style because they don't need to be supportive because you have a lot of a lot of commitment there, but you don't have the competence yet. So the directing approach would be appropriate. Now, usually what happens after the first stage, a couple of things can take place. First of which, when you're starting a new task or you're learning something new, whether it's playing guitar, riding a skateboard, uh, you know, flying an airplane, whatever it is, when you're learning something new, two things can happen. First of which is the task turns out to be much more difficult than you anticipated. It's a lot more difficult to learn it. You hit some type of roadblock or it's not as interesting as you thought, right? You kind of learn a little bit, figure out that, you know what, this really isn't for me. I'm not that interested. So a couple things happen. Um, I Obviously, you're, you're faced with a decision, of course, to stop performing that particular task. But in an organizational setting, 
your leader or manager will want you to continue, obviously. So they should progress to the second style, which is coaching. Now, coaching, as you can see, is both high directive and high supportive. And the reason that it is, is that you do have some competence, right? But you're not there yet. You've been with the organization for a little bit, but you've kind of just scratched the surface in terms of what you need to know. But your, comp, your commitment is low, meaning that you're not quite sure if you want to continue. It's more challenging. So maybe you want to do something else. Your commitment begins to lessen and it's low. So a manager needs to emphasize a coaching type style, in which case they'll provide still a great deal of direction and control, but they're also going to be more supportive. They're going to encourage you to try to continue to make sure that you continue with the tasks that you're learning. Now, assuming that you make it through that second stage and go on to the third, managers will engage in what's called a supporting style, which if you're looking at the grid here, you see that it's low directive but high supportive. The reason that it's low directive is that at this stage, you have a high degree of competence, at least you should. But what happens is because they're still supporting you, when you learn a task, and say for example, when you first learn how to ride a bike, and typically the way that we learn for the most part is you're riding a bike with training wheels and you have, you know, someone holding on to the, the seat, could be a mom or dad, and that particular person, mom or dad, lets go of the seat and then you're riding on your own. And what happens is, instantly is that there's a little bit of self-doubt at first, right? If you ever try to learn a task and the person that's helping you goes away for a little bit, a little bit of self-doubt starts to creep in and you begin to wonder, can I really do this? Now, in actuality, you certainly can. You have the competence to carry out that particular task. But your commitment is what we call variable commitment, meaning that it, it is good on some days, bad on the others, depending upon what happens. So as a leader, it's important to utilize the supporting style where the control of the day-to-day -day decision making is ultimately on the follower. They're controlling what happens on the day-to-day -day basis, but... As a leader, I may still be involved. I may check in every few days just to make sure that the person is going okay. Any questions, concerns, almost like a security blanket. Now, they can do the job. They know how to. But once again, they still need a little bit of encouragement to feel like they can truly actually perform the job. Now, lastly, the last stage is what we call delegating. Uh, delegating, as you can see, is very low on the directive scale and very low on the supportive scale. And this is used only when a follower achieves a high level of competence and a high level of commitment, meaning that they are perfectly okay performing the job, they can do it, and they know they can. This is the extremely important, important part. Uh, so as a leader, it doesn't make sense to necessarily be involved heavily and give a lot of feedback because they've proven that they can perform the job duties. So why would you necessarily spend the time and energy actually doing that? Instead, what this looks like from a leadership approach is maybe initially discussing a particular problem jointly with the person, make sure that there's a good definition for what the problem is, and then ultimately letting all decision making and everything regarding the task and the achievement of the goal up to the follower. There's really limited check-in. Obviously, if there's questions, they can come to you. But at this point, they have a high degree of competence. They know they can do the work. They have a high degree of commitment. So it doesn't make sense for them to have to come to you for everything at this point or for you to have to check in with them. Now, obviously, this isn't good for all situations. And each of these leadership styles is appropriate based upon the situation. You wouldn't utilize one style all the time. The problem is, is that most managers and leaders, for that matter, have a certain style they like. It's something they're used to, they've had some success with, and they use all the time, which isn't necessarily appropriate. You have to be able to analyze the situation. Now, one thing I will mention, kind of a caveat to this particular model here, is that the developmental level of the follower is task specific, meaning that people are at different stages in various different tasks, right? Take a look at your job, for example. There are a number of different tasks that you need to do to perform your job. Some you are better than others. So it's not completely ridiculous to say that your manager may be more involved when you're completing some tasks and maybe they're less involved on others because you have a different competence level in task. It's not job specific, it's task specific. 
Now let's briefly take a look at transactional leadership. Uh, transactional leadership is based on a hypothesis that followers are motivated through a system of rewards and punishment. That in order to get people to do things, you either need to reward that behavior or punish that behavior. It's based on the concept of reinforcement theory, meaning that people are going to do things that you reinforce, whether it's through monetary incentives or non-monetary incentives like praise, recognition, and all those other different things. So the belief here is that leadership represents an exchange. Um, and this, this type of leadership is very similar to management. It's very quid pro quo, if you will, this for that, meaning that I as a leader am going to exchange certain rewards and treatment to you, the follower, and in exchange, I want certain desirable services, right? So maybe I will grant you with certain promotional opportunities if in exchange you give me a certain level of performance, a certain level of effort, a certain degree of participation. I used to utilize this particular approach with the employees that I manage specifically um, in that I allowed people that performed high in certain areas to determine for the most part their own working schedule. So not only could they craft those schedules based upon you know, what they had going on, but they typically wanted to work the majority of the hours, so to speak. So that was a way of motivating people to want to perform better, right? I will provide you with this ability or this opportunity to craft your own schedule in exchange for a certain level of performance, so to speak. And transactional leader behaviors really form the foundation for the employee and the employer relationship. They're extremely important because what happens is you start to build trust through the exchange of me providing for you and you taking care of me. There's a trust that is established that works to build upon these behaviors in the form of transformational leadership, which we'll go over in the next slide. Now, there are two primary transactional leader behaviors. There's what's known as contingent reward behavior, and there's contingent punishment. Okay? Contingent reward behavior is rewarding your employees for doing a good job. For example, when they train, uh, like Shamu, for example, over at SeaWorld to jump over uh, out of the water and above a certain height and those type of th types of things, they use contingent reward behavior. And how they do that is they start very small. They usually have like a stick or something that's underwater. And when the whale swims above that particular stick, they give him or her a piece of uh, fish. Okay, so it's a reward. So the, the whale starts to think, hey, you know what? If I swim over the stick, they start giving me food. This is kind of cool. I think I'm going to keep doing that. But what they do is they slowly start raising the actual bar. And so it's higher and higher. And sooner or later, before you know it, you're actually the bar is outside or above the water and the whale is jumping over the water so they can get that reward because that's what they know. Because if I do this, I get a specific reward if I do this. And once again, this is this is basic reinforcement theory in that we tend to get the behaviors that we are going to reward. Now, contingent punishment is providing some type of aversive consequence uh, to reduce the frequency of a certain behavior, right? So in terms of the aversive consequence, the example I gave you before is for certain performance levels, people obviously got to make their own schedules, which is contingent reward behavior because there's an exchange there. I'm rewarding them for a job well done. But for the other person, for the people that necessarily didn't meet the performance objectives or the criteria, then the result for them is they do not get scheduled very much, if anything at all. And so that provides a significant aversive consequence for them, which in turn encourages them to engage in the behaviors that I want specifically. Now, in terms of kind of the importance of transactional leadership behavior, um, I mentioned before that it's great for establishing credibility and trust. Obviously, if you make and keep your promises, people start to trust you. If your actions kind of match what you say you're going to do, there's a trust that starts to be formed there. But more importantly, in my opinion, is it establishes fairness in the workplace, right? How discouraging is it to see that one, some employee does something that maybe isn't necessarily positive. Maybe they show up late for work over and over and nothing is said to them, right? There isn't a 
interaction that takes place. There's not a conversation about it. And so that behavior continues to go on and on and on. And what happens is if there's a specific behavior you do not like, you need to correct it. Otherwise, you are condoning the behavior. If employees start showing up late for work, what happens, and this happened in a company that I worked for, um, is that management didn't say anything. There was one employee habitually late, kept showing up late over and over and over, 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes, started to get longer. And once you get to 15 or 20 minutes, you're getting pretty excessive. And so what happened is, is everyone else, including me, we're sitting there and we're thinking, that's not really fair. They're late for work. And... So they get to work less. They're receiving the same pay because we're all salaried and we're doing more work and, and they're not even here. That's not really fair. And so what we know, we've talked about motivational theories and obviously equity theory being one of them. We tend to evaluate our situation of fairness in comparison to others. We suddenly consider our situation is unfair. I'm working more. I'm putting in the same time or more time, probably getting similar pay for the most part. And this person is coming in late all the time. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to come in late too. And gradually what began to happen is everyone began to come in late, starting with 5, 10, 15 minutes. And it wasn't until that point that management decided it was significant enough to actually mention anything and kind of bring the hammer down and say, people need to show up on time. You show up to work at 8, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. But the problem is, is that they started the issue, right? Now, ultimately, we chose to engage in the behavior and the, all those different types of things. But this was a management-led uh, issue. Because they condoned the behavior initially, they didn't say anything, their silence condoned it, it made it okay for everyone else to continue with that particular behavior because it signaled to everyone in the environment that it was okay. You're not reprimanding them, so obviously it's okay. You're signaling it not by what you say, but more importantly by what you do. So there needs to be a consistency there. Obviously, managers need to correct behavior if it is not desired and reward behavior if it is desired ultimately. Otherwise, there's going to be some unfairness established in the workplace. Now, the last type of leadership that we'll discuss is what's known as transformational leadership. And transformational leadership is designed to deliver the higher than typical performance expectations, right? If there's a an exchange going on like transactional leadership. I'm only going to work as hard as I have to to achieve that result, right? To achieve that goal and then I'm not going to continue to work as hard. So is that necessarily effective? Well, it's great for establishing the base foundation, right, of trust, so to speak. But there needs to be something to get employees to work beyond what would be normally achieved with that exchange present. And that's where transformational leadership comes in. It's created out of a desire for increased performance to get to go to get employees to uh, strive to go beyond the uh, normal call of you know, duty, so to speak, is kind of the idea here. And transformational leadership appeals to our higher level needs uh, in order to motivate us to go beyond our normal expectations, to achieve things that normally we would not think possible because we're inspired to transcend our own personal self-interests. And these are extremely important, right? These types, this type of leadership is really uh, not necessarily engaged in by a significant number of people. Um, this is where true leadership, in my opinion, takes place. Transactional leadership is really more of management, so to speak. It's an exchange of rewards and for behaviors and, and desired consequences, so to speak. But transformational leadership is truly getting people to transcend their own self-interest to achieve certain goals and objectives. And there are certain uh, behaviors that leaders engaging in transformational leadership will do or will engage in. And those include articulating a vision, right? Leaders need to be able to identify new opportunities for their group and talk obviously positive about what that means. Steve Jobs was always very good at articulating a vision. 
Now, some people didn't always agree with his particular vision, but he was great at explaining and using his kind of reality distortion field, as it was popularly known as, as a way of convincing people over to his way of thinking so that they were united in their attempt to pursue a certain goal or common theme. Leaders also need to be able to provide an appropriate model. And this is extremely important because it's not so much what people say, it's what they actually do that matters. All right, we've seen this as children. It's called behavioral modeling. Have you seen a young child that tends to model the behavior of their parents? So if the parents say a certain word, so to speak, or for example, that the child isn't supposed to say, and then they hear it and they start to repeat it over and over and over again. It's called behavioral modeling. We attach importance to what people do. And so it's important, important for a consistency to be there between what the leader says and what they actually do, because people are going to discredit the leader in the event that they say one thing and they're doing another. They're preaching the importance of ethics, but they're using the company jet for personal reasons, flying the family down to vacation over in Florida somewhere. There has to be a consistency there in order for transformational leadership to take place. Uh, leaders also foster acceptance for group goals. It's extremely important to be able to unify the group towards one common sense of purpose, kind of a rallying point. Um, and also environment, environments tend to be competitive in this case, right? We compete for very scarce resources. A lot of times your raise isn't necessarily determined based upon what your contributions are, but economic factors, right? The economy is bad. You may not get a very good raise this year. Not no, so much a sense that you didn't do a good job. That's beside the point. But how do you unify people when there are scarce resources? If I get a really good raise, someone obviously doesn't get as good of a raise. And so leaders also provide the ability to rally followers to work towards one common goal, to get beyond themselves and their own self-interest and to work towards a higher purpose. The next, things, next thing that leaders do is communicate high performance expectations. It's important that the leader demonstrates an expectation of excellence, of quality, of high performance, right? Setting the bar too low and people aren't going to have to strive to hit that particular goal. Now, of course, if you set it way too high, it can be demotivating and people may know that there's no shot that they can ever achieve that. And so that has to be considered as well. Next, providing individualized support. It's extremely important that the leader obviously supports the followers and is concerned for their personal feelings, right? It's when we tend to think that we're only just a statistics, a number, some type of tool that's being used to accomplish something when we tend to get uh, somewhat frustrated with our situations. We like to think that we are cared about not necessarily for what we do, but for who we are as people. And it's important that leaders have the ability to develop a personal bond and connection with their followers to get them to ultimately work beyond just the paycheck or just the goals and objectives. Now I'm not necessarily just working for those things. I'm working for this particular person because I know that they care about me as an individual, not necessarily as an employee. And lastly, providing intellectual stimulation. Um, it's important that leaders challenge assumptions, right? Things like, hey, that's the way we've always done it. It's very, very uh, disconcerting because the problem is, is that you tend to overlook things, right? We're familiar with this concept of groupthink, the tendency for people to start to think similarly to one another the longer that they've been together. And that's not a good thing because once we start to think alike, we start to overlook things. The benefit of groups is people have different perspectives and there's going to be some healthy conflict that comes into place that helps us air out some of the issues and some of the things that won't work necessarily. And so leaders need to be able to challenge their followers to re-examine those assumptions, to think about how things are get done, to think outside the box is the common terminology to be done in this case. Now, one thing I will say about this is that transformational leadership is not just good practice. You shouldn't just do it because it really provides a great deal of organizational success. It can provide a competitive advantage if you can motivate your employees to ultimately work beyond just the paycheck, the rewards, the tangible things I receive, but ultimately I'm working for this higher purpose. And maybe you've been so lucky to work for such an organization in which you identified with the mission and you identified with the values and you were working just for the work's sake and the value that you were derived from it, not necessarily just getting some type of reward. 
Now, one of the very important things that leaders do is they often make decisions, of course. So it's important to understand, you know, really what's the process that we go through to actually make sound decisions. And there's such a thing known as the rational decision making model, and it outlines what are the things that need to be done? What's the steps that need to be taken in order for for me to get to a point to where I am making an actual decision. And there are six stages in this particular process. Uh, the first of which is you have to define the problem. And this is one of the most important steps. I would argue probably the most important. And there's a lot of issues that come up here because people fail to properly define what the actual issue is. They jump right to, well, we need to do this. Well, that's a solution. What actually is the problem? that we're actually facing. I'll give you a kind of a uh, more uh, interesting and simplistic example just so you kind of see how this works and give you an example of that. Um, my, my brother was uh, shopping for a car at one point and he had a older vehicle. It, you know, stopped working. It was a, you know, probably, probably about, uh, I would say about 19, 20 years old. So it definitely got his use out of it for sure. And uh, it was basically falling apart. So, you know, made the decision that it wasn't cost effective to put money into the repairs. It was just better to buy another vehicle. So he instantly jumps to, well, I need, I need a new car now. And he said, okay, well, what, what do you need? What are you looking for? Well, I have, I'm looking at all these newer model vehicles, right? Just basically new model or one year old type stuff. And he's kind of going over the, the, the financing with me and all those types of stuff. And is asking me, Hey, you know, do you think you may be able to co-sign and you know, I can't quite afford it, but I need a new car. I said, well, you, you don't need a new car. And he kind of looks at me a little puzzled and says, well, what do you mean? And I said, you need transportation. Right? You need something to get you from point A to point B. It could be a bus for all that matters. You just need transportation. He says, well, yeah, that, that makes sense. It's like, so look at it from the framework of not necessarily I need a new car. That's not, that's not something that's going to solve your problem. Could a new car solve your problem? Absolutely. But it's one of the alternatives. And so going down the road of defining your problem too soon without considering certain things can cause you to overlook certain alternatives, just like my brother did in this example. Um, now, once you define the problem, once you have a good handle on what the issue is, you have to identify what your alternatives are. And this is kind of the brainstorming phase. You identify every single possible thing that could solve that particular problem that you have it can be completely realistic, completely ridiculous. It does not matter at this point. You want to get as many as possible. The idea being the more options I have, the more I'm going to have to choose from, the better my options are going to be. Now, once you've done that, you want to evaluate your alternatives. You want to have some way of measuring what's going to be the best option, right? You develop some type of selection criteria for my brother. He looked at Miles per gallon were important to him, right? There are certain things that you are going to find that are important and you kind of hold those up as a litmus test almost. And if they meet that particular thing, then maybe they move on to the next hurdle. And then you slowly start to whittle the numbers down to maybe a select few to which you can actually choose from. So you have to have something in place to evaluate people, right? We do this commonly in the selection process with hiring, where we have a way to evaluate people. We have them fill out an application and submit a resume and do some type of intelligence test, come in for an interview, all the while we're using those things as hurdles to eliminate people from the actual process. The next thing that you do is you have to select the best alternative. After you've evaluated everything and put them through the rigor of your particular evaluation method, you have to select the best alternative and you define obviously what that is, so to speak. Once you've selected it, then you implement the chosen alternative, right? Put it into action, whatever that is. For my brother's case, he had evaluated the vehicles. He had selected the one he would like. Then he went out and he bought himself a car. Okay. And the last thing that you do, and this is an important stage right here that people often overlook, is you have to follow up and evaluate your results. You know, was the decision that you made effective? If it's not, that can be okay, but you need to be able to learn something from it. Right? I've learned a great deal more from things that I've not necessarily done well than anything that I've done right.
And once you stay, take a step back and objectively evaluate what went good, what didn't go so good, why didn't it go well, and what could have you done differently, that's where true learning takes place. And so it's really important that you have that last point there if you're going to be progressing and developing as a leader. Now, obviously, the examples I gave you are fairly simplistic, and it's not, you know, you wouldn't want to be naive enough to think, man, it's really easy. I can now make great decisions. Because what happens is there's a lot of different behavioral issues that begin to creep in and begin to affect our ability to actually make good decisions. You know, if it was that easy, everyone would make great decisions all the time. But the problem is, is that people don't always make decisions in the most logical manner. There are certain things that become involved that will affect our ability to make good decisions. And there are a couple of these things listed here. You have intuition, escalation of commitment, and lastly, risk propensity. Uh, intuition, obviously, is somewhat innate, right? We have certain beliefs about something. You have a certain gut feeling that you really can't explain. You can't articulate it to people, but you just have a feeling about something. And we need to be kind of cautious with that. Um, intuition can be a great asset. There are a lot of great leaders and managers who use their intuition to make some great business decisions. But intuition in the hands of someone who is inexperienced is extremely dangerous because you don't yet have the, the experience of making decisions and seeing the ramifications and seeing the results to actually develop good intuition. To, to intuition is something that's developed over time. You don't start out with good intuition. It's guessing really. But you develop good intuition after seeing decisions implemented, seeing the results, seeing the before and the after. That's when you start to develop really good intuition. So intuition in itself isn't bad, but in the hands of someone who's inexperienced, it can be extremely problematic because you have somebody who's flying by the seat of their pants and making decisions without anything objective and just based upon what they feel, which can be very, very problematic. So you do want to check that, of course, that can be an extremely detrimental issue to making good decisions in a logical way. Uh, next, you have escalation of commitment. Um, escalation of commitment is the idea that once people make a certain decision, they are committed to following that course. Right? Say, for example, if you purchase, well, I'll give you a great example. There was an article written in the mid-90s by a gentleman by the name of Steve, Stephen Kerr, and he wrote an article on escalation of commitment. Uh, I believe it was him, but it was on escalation of commitment. And what the idea was, and he analyzed a couple of situations, actually, interestingly enough. He analyzed um, draft picks, um, specifically related to basketball players in the NBA. And so he wanted to analyze if a player was drafted earlier, right, in the first round, and even you know earlier in that round, would the team stick with that particular player longer than someone who drafted a player maybe in the second or third round if they weren't performing well? And this is what's known as escalation of commitment. If I pay a player, one, I spend my number one draft pick on them, and then I spend multiple million, millions of dollars on them, right? I have a lot riding on this. I don't want to pick the wrong player. And so at that point, I'm more committed to keeping with them and to staying with them, giving them more time to develop because I spent a lot of money on them. I wasted the number one draft pick. I'm going to look bad that I can't make good decisions. I'll probably lose my job over this, so to speak. So really, you're more escalated to continuing with them, right? This happens a lot in football as well. Right? You spend a lot of money, you go out and you get yourself a Jamarcus Russell for the Oakland Raiders, you spend the number one draft pick, spending tens of millions of dollars, and you keep at it. You, hopefully he'll improve, hopefully he'll improve, all the while as you're throwing good money after bad, because it's a sunk cost, right? That draft pick's gone, you can't get it back. It's a sunk cost, it's an accounting term. That money that you paid him, it's gone, you can't get it back. You have to evaluate your decisions based upon what the present is, not based upon what you did in the past. And unfortunately, we have a hard time doing that, especially with, say, repairing automobiles, for example. When an automobile breaks down and you're faced with the decision to either, you know, basically junk it or uh, pay money to repair it, you know, oh, it's going to be $400. You think, well, I just put in like two grand into it. So I, I probably should keep it. That's 
illogical because the money you spent's already gone, right? It shouldn't factor into the equation because you spent the money, you're not getting it back, it's done, it's a singular event. You can't look at them as combined events, so to speak. Unfortunately, we don't think that way. And that's a problem not only with individual decision making, but it's a problem in sports specifically. You have teams that get committed to a player. And once I've made the commitment, especially if I've invested a lot of time and money into that person, I'm less inclined to want to walk away from them and deem that a failure because that looks bad on my part. And I don't necessarily want to do that. Risk propensity is the last behavioral issue here. Um, obviously, certain people are very risk averse, meaning they don't like risk. They tend to stay away from it. Not all risk is bad. You have to take risks, but you want them to be calculated risks. And so if you have someone who maybe has is very risk averse, then they're not going to make decisions that they deem is somewhat risky, even after evaluating the alternative, so to speak. And so this in itself isn't bad. Now, you obviously don't want someone who just loves risk. And because something is risky, they want to go through with it. All the while, all the signs are saying, this is not really a good idea. Those are things you have to consider as well. And so these are three primary behavioral issues that are involved, uh, not only just in a management setting, but really in everyday life that you need to consider when ultimately making sound, logical decisions. All right, that concludes this particular lecture on leadership. Thank you very much for listening. I really appreciate it. Hope you have a great week. Please let me know if you have any questions.